Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Guardians of the Future podcast. I'm Justin Ladder, your host. Uh, I know it's been a couple of weeks. We haven't even had a podcast since the season started, but uh, things are busy with, uh, with Lockdown Guardians, and uh, I had some personal stuff to deal with the last couple of weeks, and uh, trying to finish up the the uh, prospect report and uh, scouting reports and countdowns. So hopefully we'll get that done at some point in the next few weeks. I do apologize for that, but it'll get done. Uh, we're going to get more of these as the season goes on when time allows. I definitely want to get more of these in once I start getting to more games. But uh, got a co-host today, a special guest. Uh, it's Jason Prill, the broadcaster from the Lynchburg Hillcats. He's going to join us and talk all about the Hillcats so far. They've had an interesting start to the season. But before we get into um, what's going on in Lynchburg, Jason, tell everybody your, your background a little bit because you're you are a local guy, actually. Thanks for joining me. I, by the yeah, way. I am a local guy. I grew up in Brunswick, Ohio, so about 30 minutes south of Cleveland, for those of you who might not know the area super well. Uh, went to Brunswick High School, grew up a Guardians fan, uh, and I've always dreamed of working within the organization, taking over for Tom Hamilton one day. I mean, who hasn't dreamt that, uh, especially from my generation, just seeing uh, all those opportunities before you. And so uh, I decided to come down to Lynchburg uh, and pursue a degree in digital media from uh, Liberty University. And then COVID hit. I graduated at the same time and there was no sports happening whatsoever. So it's kind of hard to find a job in sports when sports don't exist. So I went back, got a master's degree in strategic communication, while at the same time doing some freelance broadcasting stuff and submitted my tape uh, with a job opening at the Hillcats and landed the job. And here I am now two years later or two years in uh, having the time of my life. That's good. So who, who did you grow up listening to? Who are some of your, your favorite broadcasters? Who do you try to pick up things from? I mean, is Tom Hamilton one of them? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, at the at the end of the day, Tom Hamilton tops the list. Uh, I try to model as much of what I do after him. I think he's a bona fide professional. Uh, he's excellent. He can describe the game well. Um, and he knows interesting stories, and he can weave them in. I've always been more of a radio guy myself uh, than TV. Uh, and so they say I have the face for radio, so it fits perfectly. Uh, but I get that uh, all the time, too. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why I was lucky to do the podcast on video for a couple of years. And I'm like, someone's like, you got to do YouTube. I'm like, ah, oh, great. So, uh, yeah, I know. Do that. Uh, does everything have to have video nowadays? Yeah, I guess uh, so. Thanks. Thanks, 2020. Now we have a lot of Zoom and everything. Everyone's got access to this stuff. Now we've all got to put our faces out there, unfortunately. I know. It's too bad that I can't just like stop my camera or hide my video from every meeting that I'm a part of or uh, any broadcast. Now they put a lipstick cam in my box, so they should be able to um, see me which I was really upset about. But, uh, yeah, no, Tom Hamilton uh, definitely tops the list. Um, uh, obviously, all of the Cleveland guys. Fred McLeod, if you jump over to basketball, I just love the way he describes things and the way he was able to come up with metaphors uh, and similes at, just on the spot, it felt like. Uh, and so I've tried to emulate a little bit of that, uh, not to the full extent uh, as to how he did it or some of my uh, colleagues have done it. Um, but those are probably the two names that come to my mind when I think of broadcasters that I've, I've strived to emulate for my time. Yeah, those are good, uh, good guys to model things after for sure. A lot of good role models coming from, from Cleveland. We've had a lot of good broadcasters here. All right. So, um, pretty good opening homestand for the, uh, for the Hillcats. I mean, three and three, uh, I should, yeah, three and three. It got a lot of offense from the team. Uh, in a couple of games, you know, pitching was was good in a couple of them as well. Um, guy I want to ask you about first, what, your first impression of Nate Furman, because Nate Furman was kind of the first guest on this podcast, now that we're in this new format. Uh, seemed like a really good dude, and I noticed the first game of the season he was batting ninth, and I'm like, well, that's weird, because I kind of know Nate's background a little bit. I, I, I watched him in college, and I know people who have scouted him, and I was like, wow, he's not leading off. And of course, the second game of the season, he's leading off, and now it looks like he's taken off. So what are your what are your first impressions of Nate Furman? I mean, it seems like the leadoff spot was just destined for him. And and what do you think about his play so far? Yeah, he I have loved watching Nate Furman play. And I, I can actually speak into a little bit about the, the leadoff thing that happened in game number one. Uh, they're also very high on Tyrese Turner. Uh, and so they were trying to figure out who would fit into that one hole 
two hole and the nine hole so that they could just kind of lead right into it. So they started with Furman at nine uh, and now they've moved him up to the leadoff spot and he has thrived. So I think he has locked that down for the foreseeable future, but he's the definition of a spark plug uh, for the team. I was talking with uh, Andrew Coleman, who's the strength and conditioning coach for the Hillcats. And that's the word that he used to describe him before the season even began. He's the definition of a spark plug. You see him uh, during the game. He's got a little perch in the, uh, top corner of the dugout that he just leans over. Typically where the manager stands, that's where he's at. And he's talking to the guys and encouraging them, coaching them up. I watched him on Sunday uh, before, I believe it was either the eighth or ninth inning. Uh, he pulled uh, Juan Benjamin aside uh, and was just talking to him and kind of coaching him up after what he saw in his last at bat against the pitcher that was on the mound uh, and walking him through. And that's veteran stuff. That's things you don't see out of a guy in in a ball. Those are what you what you see from guys who've been playing the game 10, 15 years, pulling guys aside, walking them through an at bat, showing them or telling them what they're going to, to face or experience. And that's already Nate Furman. He is the kind of guy that you can build uh and develop around. Uh, he's a fun guy to watch, a great leader. Uh, and I think he's going to be a staple in the Guardians organization for a while. I tweeted out uh, the other day, I think he's going to be in the top 30 by midseason. Uh, I agree. We we all thought he was underrated. <laughs> yeah. Oh, very underrated. And he is slotted in perfectly. Uh, they were even, even trying him out at third base at one point. And so he's a little bit flexible in that infield because there is that middle infield uh, log jam uh, within the Guardians. Uh, and so he's already trying to broaden his game. Uh, and so I can't speak more highly of Furman, uh, talented guy, fun to watch, great at bats. Uh, and just through one week, I can tell he's going to be probably the stud on this team. I wonder how long you'll have him in Lynchburg. Now there's, there's a couple of guys in Lake County that, that were down there last year. They're going to get some time in Lake County. So Furman will probably be there for a while. And, um, I don't know. I, I felt like out of the, out of the draft, he was ready for high a, so it looks like he's, I don't know if he's ready for high A, but he definitely is more than ready for for pro ball. It looks like he's uh, not had any issues yet. Not any yet, and I completely agree with you. I hope he sticks around for a while for for my sake, for his sake. I hope he can he can progress through the through the organization. The name that comes to my mind when I think of him is Jason Kipnis, uh, a guy that Guardians fans would know really well. Uh, just you look at his his build, his size, his energy level, his hustle. Uh, and his approach at the plate. Uh, those are the things that I, I recognized in him right away. And the same things I saw in a young Jason Kipnis when he uh, jumped into the majors. And so I think that is a a very early fair comparison for him. And if that's the case, I think a lot of Guardians fans would be very pleased uh, to see that kind of development and growth. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to seeing him a lot more. I agree. The, uh, the maturity and, like you said, spark plug definitely uh, describes him. That's the skill set, too. Another guy that had a very brief cameo last year, I think maybe a couple of games in Lynchburg before he got hurt, was I think it's Wilfredo Antunia, as you would know better than I would. I think it's Wilf Wilfredo is how you pronounce it. Yes. Um, he's off to a good start so far. I, I don't know what your impressions of him were last year before he got hurt because it was so so brief. But uh, what can you tell us about his start so far and maybe what you remember? Is this kind of what he looked like in the very few games you saw him last year? Yeah, we didn't see him for much. He was only up here for five or six games, and I think about half of them were on the road, uh, and I don't travel with the team. Uh, and so I only get to see him uh, or saw him a little bit. Uh, but I did get to watch him uh, a lot this week uh, when he was in the ball game, And just his approach at the plate, uh, it's a pro approach. He's patient. And when he gets to two strikes, he doesn't panic. There's a lot of guys at a ball who, when they get to two strikes, they try and force the issue. They try to overswing. We saw that a lot with the team last year that was in Lynchburg. Uh, but Antunez is the exact opposite. I watched him foul off five or six straight pitches, and all of them were good pitches on the corners um, or a hard fastball that would have been tough to catch up to. And his approach just changes, and that's a pro at bat. Uh, and he's also the kind of guy who not just sees a lot of pitches, uh, but finishes the at-bat. He puts the ball in play. Uh, he can hustle out a ground ball. Um, he makes people work. He forces issues. He forces pressure, uh, which is incredible. I, there's a reason he's the 27th ranked prospect for Cleveland. Uh, and 
he he's proving it. He's showing it so far early in the season, just with the way uh, he's at the plate. He had a four hit game, uh, I believe, either on opening night or the day after. Uh, and the next day he had a rough night with three strikeouts, but uh, he bounced back uh, in his next couple of games, picked up a couple of knocks. Uh, and so I think as long as he can continue to develop well, uh, continue to grow those long at bats that he's getting uh, will help him progress through the organization as they see that he's got a great eye at the plate and a great presence as well. Yeah. It's good to hear about the patience too, especially at that level and at that age and a uh, very limited track record of pro ball experience in our outside of, of Arizona. So I've read earlier in the year, he had some interesting colored hair. Does he still have interesting colored hair or is it, is it back to normal? <laughs> It's back to normal. I don't think anyone wants to go with the hill cat green or blue for their hair color. So oh, come on. <laughs> I mean, their class A's got blue. You can, they can do it. Someone can it do it. It works more for class A than it does for somebody in a ball. So. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, more young guys. I, I don't know how much we know about this guy yet, but I just noticed that Manuel Mejia is the youngest position player in the system who is on an, an affiliate roster. He's a catcher with some contact ability. Uh, any, any thoughts on him so far? I just point him out. Like I said, cause Normally they've got a handful of of 19 year olds that are out that way. And this year, I don't know if it's due to some guys having injuries or just the way the the timing has worked out for things, but he's the youngest guy in the system at an affiliate. Anything you can tell us on Manuel Mejias, the catcher? Uh, Well, first of all, just the fact that he's a catcher, they don't progress catchers super quickly uh, through the guardians program. And he's already an a ball at 18 years old, which is pretty impressive in and of itself. He's a switch hitting catcher which you also don't see a lot. Uh, but the one thing that really stood out to me is uh, just at the plate, he's willing to be the guy to take the sacrifice fly. He's willing to be the guy that does the little things, the dirty things that don't always get highlighted in the in the stat sheet at the end of the night or in the box score. Uh, he's that guy. So if there's a guy on third, he goes up there. He just tries to pop it up into the outfield and get the runner home. He doesn't try to do too much. He doesn't try to be the hero. Uh, he's a selfish or selfless, uh, sacrificial guy. And that's the type of team that the Hillcats are working on developing early on this season. Um, and he's leading the charge with that. And defensively, he's been very solid. Uh, obviously, stolen base numbers are up compared to some past years uh, with the larger bases and the pitch clock and uh, the step off rule. But he's done a very good job of keeping balls in front of him not letting anything really get past him. And he's taken some shots. A lot of foul balls uh, have caught his leg, his thigh, uh, his arm. Uh, He's taken a beating back there. and He keeps every single day going right behind home plate. He's already become uh, a staple in the lineup. Uh, He's listed as the almost everyday catcher, which at 18 years old, uh, if if you remember last year in Lynchburg, we didn't have an everyday catcher. It was a three-man tag team. Uh, But he's, I think he was a catcher for four of the six games in this series which is pretty impressive when uh, you think about somebody who's only 18. Uh, So I'm very impressed so far. I'm excited uh, as he continues to adjust to uh, the A level and facing some of the the guys who may have pitched in the league a year before who have developed, uh, but he's already showing a lot of progress and a lot of promise. Yeah. I do remember last year was a lot of, a lot of Joe Donovan and Victor Planchart and, uh, I'm trying to think who the other guy was. Richard was, Paz. Richter, yeah, yeah, Richard Paz. So it was, it was definitely a a rotating cast of guys back there, which can be hard for for pitchers too. I mean, you when you're not working with the same catcher every day, I know the catchers all get to know the pitchers, and you know the, the Guardians are careful about that because they value catching. But no, you're right. Having an 18 year old back there and uh, not having a rotating cast has to be better. But there, and we'll get to pitching in a second because. Um, Last year, the pitching staff was a lot older. This year, it's a it's a lot younger. Real quick before we get to pitching, though, I want to talk about Guy Lipscomb because, to me, he strikes kind of the same as Nate Furman, just a very high-energy player, contact. But I watched some of his at-bats this week when you guys were at home, and I have to say, I feel like that guy doesn't belong at low A either. Like, I'm just watching him take pitches and, and all the things he does in the box. And I'm like, man, this guy, if it wasn't for guys that are in, in Lake County now, I feel like this guy should also be in Lake County. Is that is that the right assessment so far? Yeah, that was honestly my assessment too. I was asked on either Saturday or Sunday uh, by somebody in the box. Uh, they asked me, who would be the guy that you expect to be called up first? And I said, who should be called up first and who will be called up first? I said, who should be called up first 
is Bronny Munoz. Is, and we'll, we'll get to him uh, in probably in pitching would be my guess. Uh, but also, um, Guy Lipscomb was the guy who I think uh, should be the guy who gets called up. His at-bats are incredible. He's patient. He doesn't strike out a lot. I mean, he had four straight games uh, with an extra base hit, which is impressive for a guy who's in uh, single A. Um, and coming out of college, they knew he had a lot of speed. Uh, they knew he was a good defender. I don't think they really recognized how good he actually was. Um, so I think he might be, come May, he might be transitioning up to um, high A. And I, I don't know who would fill his slot. Uh, I, personally, I hope to see uh, Jason Chirillo at some point. I'm excited about him as a prospect. Uh, I'd love to see him come and fill that that role. Uh, but I really think Guy Lipscomb, he's going to progress quickly out of uh, out of Lynchburg up to Lake County. Uh, he's just he's got the build of a Bradley Zimmer. He's tall, he's fast, um, but he he's got a much better approach at the plate. He doesn't waste pitches. He doesn't swing at junk. Uh, he if anybody, I, I said in the broadcast, I said. If Guy Lipscomb thinks it's a ball, it's probably a ball, and the umpire is wrong. He's just that good at the plate. Uh, he struggled in the last two games, but he got hit by a couple of pitches, uh, and so I think his balance and timing was a little thrown off by that. I don't know that for a fact, but uh, I, he's got one of the best uh, plate approaches we've seen uh, from a guy fresh out of college. Yeah, he should in that level for sure. He should be doing what he's doing, and – uh, I would think that I, again, I don't know who in Lake County they, they'd have to make room for, but for sure he seems so far like he's adjusted to pro ball. Well, uh, first pitcher I think we need to get to, of course, is Parker Messick. Everyone's going to want to talk about him. Uh, another guy who I think is just doing what everybody expects. He's coming out, he's throwing strikes. I know he's kind of living in that, you know, 90, 92 range, like, like he did in college, but um, yeah. What, what are your, what are your thoughts on Messick so far? I mean, I feel like he's one of those guys where his command is just so good that, uh, that level, it's hard. It's hard for pitters at that level sometimes to handle guys who throw strikes like that because they're not used to guys having, you know, two or three pitches they can throw for strikes when they're at that level. Yeah, I mean, he's he's not overpowering guys. I mean, we're seeing especially now uh, fastballs up in the upper nineties. We've hit a uh, hundred a couple times uh, in in low A, which is pretty impressive for that level. And then there's Parker Messick who comes out ninety ninety two. Uh, and he's striking guys out. He's getting batters to look silly or ground into something that's super easy for the infield. Uh, he's just he's consistent. Uh, he never takes a pitch off. He's always locked in. Um, and he's fun to watch. He's a great guy, great personality, genuine dude. Um, and it's been a joy to watch him pitch. Uh, his breaking ball has been excellent so far. Uh, he's another guy, like you mentioned, especially being a lefty. Uh, and that's going to benefit him a lot as he goes through this organization uh, as being a lefty starter. I think he's got a bright future. Obviously, they'd like to see him get that velocity up a couple of ticks. Uh, but I think that will come uh, with some of the conditioning and training they'll be putting him through, uh, which is why I think he'll be in a ball for a while, especially with some of the pitching staffs that are above him. Uh, but I, I'm a, I've enjoyed watching him in his first two starts. He's pitched excellent in both of them. Um, he still has an ERA of zero, which is uh, – I believe he has an ERA of zero. I could be wrong on that. Um, but he's looked incredible. He's never looked nervous or rattled or out of command. Uh, he's had complete control of every ball game and every inning and every batter he's faced. Yeah, 10 innings, uh, one earned run. It was a home run, 10 strikeouts, a walk. He has given up 10 hits. That's the only thing. So it looks like he's given a hit per inning, but – well, he's still one homer. He uh, seven of his hits came in his first start, the home of the opener up in Fredericksburg. And if you look at the Nationals roster, they yeah. have a lot of top thirty guys. I mean, Elijah Green is over there. He's their number three prospect, so they're stacked and loaded uh, across their lineup. So he was facing a tough lineup, and he held them scoreless in that game. So yeah. I think that number is a little bit inflated uh, by who he was facing uh, in his first professional start. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot to ask for sure. All right, you mentioned Brody Munoz. I was just going to kind of ask you who was else has impressed you so far. And Munoz, I know, had – what was it? Was it four? He had a couple of no hit innings the last time out, or, or was it five no-hit innings? I can't remember how far he got. But um, it sounds like he's impressed you so far. And I think you guys might have seen him a little bit last season, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he was – so this is actually his third year in Lynchburg. He came up uh, toward the end of 21. 
Uh, so we didn't make a ton of starts there last year. He was with Lynchburg the whole season, typically in a piggyback bullpen role. Uh, and so he didn't get to really fully demonstrate his capabilities. And then this year he was assigned back and uh, you could tell he was when he when he, he was locked in when he got to Lynchburg, just the way he was interacting with people. His mindset was, I'm going to advance this year. I'm going to go through the organization. I'm going to make progress. And that's how he came out and has pitched so far this year. His first start of the year, five no-hit innings uh, against a pretty decent Myrtle Beach lineup uh, with a lot of guys in their top 30. Uh, and then he pitched again on Sunday, and he pitched pretty well. A little less consistent, gave up some hard contact, gave up some hits, but they came farther into his start. Uh, the first couple innings, he was pretty solid. Um, he had to work out of some some jams a little bit, uh, but the hard contact didn't come until later into his start when he had made a lot of pitches. So I think he's a guy who's he's, he's really impressed me. He impressed me a lot last year. I was kind of shocked to see him back in the Hill City uh, for this season. But uh, obviously Cleveland knows something that I don't, and they assigned him there. But I think uh, he'll be a guy that gets called up soon, especially I think, believe he's 22 or 23 years old. Uh, and so he's a guy that can slot up. And he can fill a bullpen role. He can be a starter. Uh, he can do a lot of different things. He's very versatile. What other pitchers, too? Because, like I said, last year you had, what, Reed Johnson. You had Trenton Denholm, uh, Will Dion, Rodney Boone. These are all, you know, 22, 23-year-old college kids. This year, you know, you got Bronny Munoz, who's 22, uh, or should play most of the year, 22. Mark Messick's a little bit older. Jacobs is a college kid. Uh, Alonzo Richardson was there last year for a little bit. You still got Juan Zapata. Austin Peterson's a college kid. Like, it's just so weird to see this isn't, this is, uh, I guess it's the same. It's still an older pitching staff, but now Richardson's 20, Jacobs is still 21, and, and Yorman Gomez, who I'm really interested in, uh, is only 20. So maybe it's a, a slightly younger pitching staff. I guess maybe not as young as I thought it was. It's a little bit younger. Uh, I think there's fewer college guys because, I mean, the 21 draft was, what, 19, 20 pitchers in the draft? Yeah. In, insane. Uh, and so they uh, almost all slotted into Lynchburg that year. A couple made Lake County to start the season. Uh, this year, there was less pitchers drafted, and most of them made their way back to Lynchburg. Um, but there's also more of that influx of the Dominican development uh, that we're seeing uh, coming through Lynchburg. Uh, you think of a guy like Jorman Gomez, uh, who uh, he impressed in his first couple starts, uh, struggled a little bit in this last one, but I think he, he's got some overpowering stuff, mid-90s fastball, and he's pretty young. So that, that's going to continue to develop and help him rise. Alonjo Richardson has looked very good. Uh, he's pitched two solid outings uh, so far this season. They gave him five innings in his start in Lynchburg this past week, which uh, they're already showing that they can give these guys more innings. Last year, we didn't see a guy go past four for probably a whole month. And now we have several guys who've already pitched a minimum of five innings in at least one of their starts. Uh, and then uh, another name that's really impressed is uh, Sammy Vasquez out of the bullpen. He's kind of filled the closer role that was left by Elvis Jerez uh, last season. Um, and he's, fit in very perfectly. Uh, he's been up around upper 90s fastball, 98, uh, low end 96, high end. He's hit 101 when he was in uh, Fredericksburg uh, last weekend. So an overpowering fastball. Uh, he's developed a strong slider, and he even worked on creating a, a changeup for his arsenal this offseason. Uh, he's been showing that off a little bit. And I know uh, I was talking to him a little bit before the season started. And he was super excited uh, to show everyone that he had developed a changeup. So we've seen that a little bit. Uh, and he's there were times last year where he it felt like he was trying to overthrow uh, and he would pull it a little bit off to the side and into the left handed batter's box uh, and it would get away from whoever was catching that night. This season, though, he's been sitting in the strike zone or near the strike zone, down and away, painting the corners. And he's looked very confident on the mound, full control. And another guy I want to shout out, Rennie Artiles, uh, a guy who really struggled with his command last season. Uh, and it just when he went out there last year, you were worried whether or not he'd be able to throw a strike. Uh, every He would load up the bases by walking guys. Yesterday, they brought him in in a bases loaded situation with only one out. Uh, and all he gave up was one run on a sacrifice fly. Uh, and then he got a guy to ground out right back to him. And then he came back in. Uh, in the ninth inning and shut them down with ease. 
So he's a guy that uh, I'm really impressed with early on. He seems to have found his command. He's got a good fastball uh, and a pretty solid slider that if that continues to develop, can be tough to hit. So uh, a couple of the back end bullpen guys have also been uh, really impressing me early on this year. I caught a little bit of Sean Rapp too, and his his arm angle looks nasty. So oh, that's tough to pick up that sidearm yeah. slot or quarter uh, three quarters arm arm slot. It's tough to pick up. Yeah, so it looks like those, you guys are going to have a good bullpen down there. A uh, lot of interesting names. I did watch part of Austin Peterson start. He looked looked okay. I'm expecting a lot more from him as the season goes on. He was a pretty advanced college arm, so I'm looking forward to to, to watching more of him. Um, anybody else from the Myrtle Beach series we didn't talk about? I mean, I know I watched Jose Devis hit his first home run of the year. He made a nice play at shortstop as well. Uh, anybody else from that uh, Myrtle Beach series that we missed? I mean, Devers probably tops the chart as to who I was most impressed with. Uh, just, I didn't know about, know much about him coming into the year. I don't think a lot of people really did, uh, but his defensive presence has been incredible. I, there were probably three or four plays that I had to circle on my scorebook to go back and cut the highlight because the play was just that good. I mean, there was one on uh, opening night where the ball was um, between third and short, and he slid, uh, backhanded it, hopped up, and from his back foot threw it to first and got the guy by a step or two. And it was just one of the best plays I've ever seen live. I, even some pro guys can't make that play. So I, I didn't expect that from him coming into the year, and I think he was a guy that was going to be a plug-in place, a fill-in guy in, in, the, uh, in the lineup at different points. But because of his defensive ability and now his bat hitting a home run had a couple other clutch hits uh, throughout the series. I think he's a guy we're going to see more regularly. And I think defensively they're going to need him and you'll see him maybe in late game uh, scenarios uh, be a defensive substitution. Uh, the other name that really uh, impressed me this week was Juan Benjamin uh, and his presence at the plate. He's riding a six game hitting streak. He had a sick uh, hit in every game that he, uh, played him. He had a couple three hit games as well. Uh, a handful of RBIs. Uh, he fit into that two hole pretty nicely behind uh, Nate Furman. So I think he's another one of those guys that I thought may be just kind of a rotation guy and finding different roles for him, but he can play anywhere on the infield and he plays it pretty solidly. You're not too concerned uh, with his defense anywhere, kind of like a Dion Frias. Uh, who we saw last year and then was in the World Baseball Classic. I don't think to the same uh, same level, at least, of personality of, of Frias, <laughs> but uh, Ben Hameen, certainly another guy who impressed me uh, throughout the week. And then, uh, honestly, just all the guys who got on base, their <laughs> dedication and commitment to running. I think they had, uh, going into Sunday, they had 22 stolen bases, and wow. then they had six more on Sunday. Uh, and three of them belonged to Guy Lipscomb. Uh, so they had, what, 28 steals uh, in nine games so far this season, and that's far and away leading the Carolina League. They're smart on the base paths. They're aggressive on the base paths. They don't make stupid mistakes, and when they do, they have the presence of mind to know what's going on around them, and that in and of itself at this level is rare. Uh, I've watched a lot of bad base running, uh, even last year, we saw a lot of bad base running, uh, running in Lynchburg. This season, we haven't had any of that. There's been no mistakes. It's been nearly flawless. Uh, they've been aggressive. Uh, and that's credit to guys like Jordan Smith, the manager, uh, Jan Rivera, the bench coach. I know they've both been working on developing an aggressive base running strategy. Uh, and so props to the guys for uh, adapting to that, buying into that uh, mindset, uh, and just going out there and having a willingness to run. So those have kind of been my biggest takeaways and impressions uh, of this team. I'm glad you mentioned Jordan Smith. I was going to quickly ask you your impression of him so far. I've been covering Cleveland prospects long enough to have seen Jordan Smith now as a player and a coach. That is not something I ever <laughs> thought would happen. But uh, when he was in Lake County, somebody who used to own a card shop where I grew up in Wycliffe, um, she worked for the captains and she – made like this wood cut out with a card of his. She did it for a lot of people that she really liked. And I think we gave Jordan Smith the nickname of the milkman. So next time you talk to Jordan Smith, ask him if he still has that wood cut out plaque that Kathy gave him and ask him if he still goes by the nickname of the milkman. Cause he, I don't think he really liked it in Lake County, but for whatever <laughs> reason they would, they would show this thing on the scoreboard of him 
with a milk mustache and it stuck forever. But uh, what, what are your first impressions of Jordan Smith, the manager? I, I could not be any more impressed the way he commands the dugout, the man, he com- uh, the way he commands the, the clubhouse, uh, the, the coaching staff uh, it's beyond his years. He's wise beyond his years. He's mature. Uh, he listens to guys like uh, Tony Arnold, who's the pitching coach uh, and gleans from their knowledge and from their experience while also investing a, a young energy uh, and enthusiasm that um, uh, he only he or guys like him uh, and Jan Rivera can bring due to their youthfulness and uh, freshness to, to the coaching ranks. Uh, and he's a guy that stands up for his players. And uh, I don't know if you caught yesterday's ball game or not, but at the very end, uh, there was a questionable strike three call on uh, Mike Coyedo, which was everybody was fuming. Coyedo was not happy. Uh, and so Jordan Smith comes walking down the uh, the third baseline and gets in the face of the umpire and walks him out of the ballpark. He got tossed, uh, which we can say whatever we want about that. But just having a guy that you know has your back, uh, I overheard uh, Guy Lipscomb talking to a, a local reporter, and he was talking about that. Just knowing that you have a manager that's going to have your back and that's going to go and fight for you. Uh, and going to stand up for you in different situations, I, it just motivates the team. It motivates the clubhouse. It motivates uh, each and every person uh, when they go up to bat, when they go on the mound, just knowing they have a guy who's going to stand by them and fight for them. Uh, and he's doing this at a very young age with very little experience at, at a high full season coaching uh, ranks. And I've been nothing but impressed so far. Still some things that he's trying to work out. He threw up a late stop sign uh, one day and a guy got caught in a pickle, which uh, threw everyone for a loop. But uh, those will come and you'll you'll deal with them and you'll manage with them. But overall, just a great human being, a genuine guy uh, and a guy the players seem to love because he stands up for them. Managing and coaching third base seems like a lot. I don't know why they do it in the minors, but that seems very, very difficult to do. So I think they'll get that. Uh Lynchburg heads on the road this week to play the Salem Red Sox. They return home uh, April 25th through April 30th for a home stand with uh, Fredericksburg as they took on the opening series. So that'll be another tough one. Uh, looks like you guys got some good stuff going on there. You got a, a bark in the park night coming up, some fireworks, uh, college ID night. That'll be fun. Winning Wednesdays and uh, kids run the bases on Sundays. What other stuff can people look forward to uh, on the next home stand at uh, Bank of James Stadium? Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a fun time to be in Lynchburg this season. I, this past series, shout out to our community and our fans. We way out uh, way outnumbered our, our our tickets sold and our attendance from last season's opening series, uh, which was super awesome to see. The players loved it. Uh, the coaches loved it. I asked Jordan about that, and he was like, "I was impressed." Uh, and it was great to have a crowd behind you. They've been engaged from first pitch. So I just want to give a shout out to them. They have been excellent through the first series, and uh, it's really setting the tone for what's to come this year. Uh, the next home stand, it'll be a fun week. Uh, we at Fredericksburg, obviously a great ball club. There's that natural in state rivalry uh, that got built, uh, especially last season when we faced oh them gosh. in the first round of the Carolina League playoffs uh, and came down after losing the first game. To winning the next two at home and uh, knowing some of the people from Fredericksburg and they just they weren't happy uh, and that just kind of ramped up the intensity all the more and that's why I think the the first series was uh, kind of caught Lynchburg off guard a little bit and they still played well but I think they got caught off guard because a lot of hangovers from the year prior were still there and were upset about how things finished I don't mm-hmm. think that's going to happen uh, at the end of April. Uh, I think Lynchburg has now realized that (laughs) they want to beat Lynchburg. Uh, And so I think it's going to be a fun series, a lot of energy, a lot of passion. It's going to be very tense, uh, which makes for great drama uh, in those ballgames. But also uh, we're debuting our our COPA branding, uh, which is the Hispanic Heritage uh, uh, Initiative by Minor League Baseball. So we're going to be rebranding as the Lemonada Stay Hill City, uh, which – equates to lemonade uh it, so our logo is pretty cool it's a yellow skull with a lemon sombrero uh which is pretty awesome i i, I can't wait i think we're supposed to get uh new jerseys and hats in I, I can't wait to see those debuted on the field players are excited about it and there's going to be a lot of cool things at the ballpark to just really embrace uh hispanic heritage and minor league baseball and help fans uh get 
um, a full understanding of just how big of a role they've played in the development of baseball uh, here in the States. And uh, it's a cool way to honor uh, the Hispanic players from today and from the past. So that's going to be a really cool weekend, two games of that. Um, and that really is going to highlight it, capped off by a great fireworks show on Saturday night. So it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, and I can't wait for them to get back home. I will be wearing one of those hats, I can already tell you. I love collecting a good, unique minor league hat. I've got uh, the Sugar Skull from Columbus. I've got the Picantes. I've got a couple other Akron ones that are just kind of – because they've been all over the board, but Mm -hmm. I love collecting a good – I've got like a Reno Aces hat. So I will be wearing one of those hats because I love collecting unique minor league hats. So Oh, yeah, and you're going to love it. I've (laughs) I've gotten a sneak peek at it, and it looks fantastic. It's it's as good as advertised. It's got a yellow brim with a a navy blue base and the the yellow – uh, skull logo. So it's it's a really well designed uh, hat and some merchandise. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah, I'll be on the lookout for that. Uh, Jason, do you have a few more minutes to talk about Lake County with us, or do you got to jump off? Uh, I got a few more minutes. I can do Lake County. All right, let's talk about Lake County then, because uh, you saw a lot of these guys last season. So I want to touch on the captains real quick while you have you. Um, great start so far. The, the pitching staff in, in Lake County has been a little bit hit or miss, but so far, Will Dion, Trenton Denholm, and Reed Johnston. Uh, off to great starts there. I watched a lot of Reed Johnson's uh, first start or last start at Fort Wayne, I should say. Um, I feel like not a lot of people talk about Reed Johnson. I I really wa- watched him a lot last year when he was down there with you guys, and he really impressed me. Fastball, slider combination. I think his changeups coming along, you know, 93, 95, it seems like that that windup of his is, is really funky. Like he has that drop down high knee. I can't really describe it, but now, no one's talking about Reed Johnson. I know he's a little bit older, but you know, I, he really impressed me last year. And the first start this year against, uh, or the start I saw him against uh, Fort Wayne, was fantastic. I just don't understand why no one is talking about Reed Johnson. Yeah, and I think part of that is because of who all he's been paired with throughout his time uh, in pro ball. I, I think last year he was piggybacking with uh, Jack Leftwich uh, mm. for a while, which Leftwich has far uh, exceeded any expectation they had for him. I mean, he's already in Akron, uh, and this is his second full year, and he only spent, what, a month and a half in uh, in Lake County last year. So he has been way overperforming. And honestly, a lot of these guys in piggyback roles often get overlooked uh, because they're paired with another guy who Cleveland is pretty high on or people are talking about. Johnson was a piggyback guy for the first half of last year until guys got called up. Uh, And so he really kind of flew under the radar for a little bit. He did really well in his piggyback role. He came into the starting rotation and was just a solid guy. There was nothing last year that overly impressed, but nothing that like worried you too much, uh, which is what you're you're kind of hoping for in minor league baseball. You don't want a guy who you trot out there and you're like, oh, this guy's, uh, we're going (laughs) to lose this game. You never thought that with Reed Johnson out there. So he always gives you a chance to win. And this year he's looked really well uh, in his his starts uh, for Lake County. Uh, And I I think he's going to develop really well. Uh, That that motion and that arm slot make it difficult for hitters to pick up uh, what pitches he's throwing, uh, where he's throwing from. Uh, And so uh, he's a bit deceptive in that way. And that's going to benefit him a ton as well. Yeah, I kind of thought he'd be a reliever out of the gate, but I was, su- I was surprised to see him get starters innings last year, and he's doing it again, but I mean, he's pitching well, so hard to take him out of that role. I don't think anybody's surprised by Will Dion so far. He is kind of operating in a, a piggyback so far uh, with Rodney Boone. They both had five innings so far, uh, but he's got a, a 1-8 ERA uh, through five innings. Rodney Boone, not after the greatest start. Trenton Denholm, I expected to see last year. Trent, I mean, uh Tanner Bybee, I know he wasn't in Lynchburg last year, but I kind of expected Trenton Denholm to be t- Tanner Bybee last year. I kind of thought that was a guy that would take off. Um, had an okay start his first time out. Uh, five innings didn't strike out a lot of guys, but uh, I know he had some good starts last year in Lynchburg. I, I did expect more out of him, but I feel like it's still in there. It's coming for, for Trenton Denholm. I know he still had some good moments, and, and, and maybe they were just a little bit inconsistent last year. Yeah, uh, Denholm, it took him a little while to really get going. Uh, I think there was an adjustment coming from college ball out west to playing in the East Coast. Uh, you think I, I was talking to um, some different people on the squad and just uh, the air is heavier, uh, which makes it a little bit more difficult to go about your daily routines and your your habits that you've gotten so used to uh, mm-hmm. and getting out there on the mound. It's more humid maybe than what you're expecting. And it took Denholm a little while to adjust. Second half of the year, he was a completely different pitcher. He 
he was dominant. And then he came out in the postseason uh, and pitched uh, excellent. He was the guy that the Hillcats could rely on. They could trot out there to pitch uh, a big game uh, and knew he was going to to provide some sort of spark off the mound. He pitched game one in Fredericksburg, and I think it was a one to nothing game uh, because of an error that was committed in the outfield. So it wasn't even his fault uh, that they ended up losing uh, that ball game. So he's a guy, uh, he's got good stuff. He's got a good hard fastball. Um, he's still young. He's a, he's a little bit small on the smaller side, uh, but he's a fun guy to watch. Uh, a, another great guy uh, and a guy who I think, like you said, Tanner Bybee, uh, who can really at some point, take off uh, and really become a, a guy that moves through the organization well. And Will Dion, I know you mentioned him a little bit. I'm a big Dion supporter. He is feisty. He is he's, – he's the nicest guy off the field and the most fun guy to hang around uh, out of probably any of the guys last year uh, that were down in Lynchburg. Um, but on the mound, he's a completely different person. He When he's locked in, he is locked in. And he's uh, – Another guy who's a little undersized, but he makes up for that with his passion uh, and his feistiness uh, and just always giving 120% every single pitch. doesn't matter if he's ahead in the count, behind in the count. He's not going to give you anything to hit. Uh, he's going to do everything he can to uh, strike you out or get you to roll over on something. Uh, and he's done a great job so far in Lake County. He did a great job in Lynchburg last year. Uh, and I know uh, I, I think he's another guy that – uh, when put in the proper situation, he could develop very nicely uh, and become a guy that could make a run toward the show. Yeah, I think so too. Good bevy of pitches. We'll see if the ball velocity comes along, but mm -hmm. control, changeup, you know, curveball. The fastball curve is ball. sneaky. Yeah, the fastball sneaky when he locates it. I mean, just because the angle on it, and, you know, he has the Kershaw motion, which everybody <laughs> loves to talk about. Um, <laughs> Quickly, Joe Lampy is kind of tearing through things in Lake County so far. <laughs> 32 plate appearances. Uh, he has five walks, one strikeout, a steal, three doubles, hitting 444 through seven games. It's early. Um, not really surprised. I think you guys might have had him for like a game last year. I'm not even sure how long he was up there, but um, not surprised by Joe Lampy at all. I, I Some people compare him to Will Brennan. I don't know if I feel that comfortable saying he's the next Will Brennan yet. The swing doesn't seem the same to me, but – the speed is there. The contact ability is there. I Arizona State's got an interesting track record of major league players, so I'm not really sure uh, how to compare those things evenly. But uh, I, I like what Joe Lampy's doing so far. But I'm also, I don't know, not surprised. Anything you remember from Joe Lampy and his very, very brief stop in Lynchburg last year? Yeah, his stop was about as short as you can make it in Lynchburg last year. I think he was up he for a walk off two. hit, right? Or his, uh, first, well, his first at bat was a, a hit. I think he. He yeah. singled at the first pitch he saw or something. That's what it yeah, was. He, his first inning on defense, I think he made a diving play in center field. And then his first at bat, he drove one right up the middle on a line drive. Uh, and so he was already off to a great start. He really, though, he cooled off a little bit after that. Like he kind of found his way out of the lineup uh, in Lynchburg as uh, some of these other guys have been playing a little bit longer, maybe more of a presence at the plate. You think of a guy like Isaiah Green, who – was very patient last year, took a lot of walks, actually owns the Hillcats single season record for walks now, wow. uh, which I just uh, discovered over the off season. Um, but Joe Lampy, from what I remember, he's quick. He's got a, a great IQ. His defense is incredible. He knows when to play it on the hop, when to lay out for it uh, and just how to play center field. Uh, and that's something that uh, you don't see a lot uh, at a younger age, but obviously having that college background and have, being able to have played high, uh, high level games for a while now, uh, it's a little bit easier for him to adjust to some of these moments and some of these pressures uh, that a lot of players fall into. So I didn't get to see him a lot. I was impressed by what he saw, especially defensively. And it's great to see his bat coming along now because we didn't get to see too much of that last year uh, in Lynchburg. One guy quickly, and I didn't see last year because he's new to the organization, is Juan Brito. Uh, I know some people might be looking at the stat line after seven games and say, wow, he's not really hitting. 343 on base. He's walked more than he struck out. I saw him hit his first home run against Fort Wayne last week. Juan Brito is going to be all right. 21 playing in high A. Won't turn 22 until pretty much the season's over. I uh, got really high valuations on, on Juan Brito so far defensively. So everybody looking at – Juan Brito's seven-game stat line, I would not be concerned at all. He looks like he belongs, and that's going to wind up being a good trade for Cleveland. We'll see what happens to him. 
Uh, his infield partner, though, you saw a ton of last year, and I and not a lot of people are are really high on his bat. And I he's a skinny guy. He wasn't drafted for his bat, but Yordis Valdez came up very late in the season to Lake County, and he was part of their playoff run. Hit the ball really well. Again, not a guy known for his bat, but he's off to a good start offensively this year. So I'm really curious to see what's going on with him. I have not been to a captain's game yet just because of you know personal stuff and other other uh, scheduling conflicts. But uh, so far through 25 plate appearances, 318, 400, 455, 147 WRC+. Plus. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to see if there's more in the bat. I think we know his defense is, is pretty good. I'm sure you can attest to that, Jason. But um, I don't know. I... I I was impressed by the bat late in the season, and so far he is hitting well this year. What are your, what was your take on Jordi's Valdez a year ago? Yeah, I completely agree with you 100%. And I think part of it came from the fact that he wasn't getting everyday reps in the field. Uh, I mean, Lynchburg last year had a couple infielders that were pretty highly rated. You think of a guy like Milan Tolentino, uh, who was getting some of those middle infield spots. And then Jake Fox, uh, he was – down in Lynchburg last year, uh, and he came out and he was he was playing incredible. He was the most patient guy I've ever seen out of high school um, to to jump right into minor league baseball. Uh, and then you had um, Diane Frias who was playing really well to start the year. Uh, and then you also he was fighting for time with Carson Tucker, uh, who at the time was a really highly rated prospect in the organization. People were talking about him pretty highly. He was a top thirty going into last season, uh, and so. Valdez really just kind of found himself on the outside looking in. Uh, when I was doing my research last year, though, Hoinsey had written an article uh, about him that described him as the next Francisco Lindor, just with his smile, his defensive presence. Obviously, there's some things that he would need to develop to get to the, the same level, but uh, his character, his demeanor, his personality, uh, and just the way he upholds himself reminded him a lot of Francisco Lindor. And I think there's some of that in him. And I don't know what his overall progression is and where he'll top out at but he's a guy that once that bat can match up with his defensive ability uh he could go a long way he can be a guy that could slot into a lineup uh at the major league level and we saw it second half of last year as he got regular reps uh and regular at bats and was playing four or five games a week instead of one or two uh he became a guy that could hit and a guy they could rely upon in big situations and so it's continuing to carry over now into Lake County. Uh, and I think the more that he plays, the better he's going to get. All right, Jason. Well, thanks for taking so much time. I know we talked about this being a little bit short. It went a lot, a lot longer, but uh, you had a lot of good insights for, from Lynchburg and, you know, obviously uh, being the only out of state team from Ohio, it's hard to get eyes down there. So uh, we appreciate you being our eyes, especially being a hometown guy and uh, looking forward to catching up and doing this with you again, if you don't mind. Absolutely. I appreciate it, Justin. Anytime. All right. Take care. Thank you as well. All right. That was Jason Prill from the Lynchburg Hillcats. A uh, lot of good things to say on, on what's going on down there and uh, certainly a lot of good insights. Happy to hear about our guy, uh, friend of the podcast, Nate Furman. Uh, real quickly, we'll run through some guys missing through rosters and uh, kind of get through some of the things I've noticed so far in Akron and uh, Columbus on the other side. All right, so from Akron so far, if you pay attention at all on Twitter, um, the Guardians have been pretty conservative with uh, Joey Cantillo, only about 60 pitches uh, per start so far. He's pitched well. Uh, I caught some of his last start the other day, and then he looked fine. Uh, arm looks quick. He looks healthy. Nothing held back, which uh, is obviously good to see from him. Very important to see so far on the season, but they're, they're going to be conservative with him. I, I, yeah, two, two games, seven innings, nine strikeouts. He does have four walks. Um, you know, a lot of rust to knock off from Joey Cantillo. So I'm not super concerned about him right now. Uh, he is on the 40, but anybody out there saying like, Oh, I wonder if Cantillo will factor in this year. I gotta be honest. I I'm pretty, I'm pretty much feeling that 
that Cantillo probably is not going to factor into the plans this year. I think if, if Joey Cantillo makes his debut, that could mean a good thing. But if that happens, I would think they would prefer it to be like August or September, the way things are going. Uh, I know the rotation's taken some hit at the major league level and they've got to get some guys up to go in place, which we'll get to here in a minute. But um, I just don't see Cantillo being in the plans for them this year. They're going to be, again, this number, this is a guy who, you know, there was no season in 2020, so he really didn't throw. 2021, he was injured most of the year with an oblique issue, I think. Uh, and then 2022, obviously he missed a lot of, uh, or, you know, he missed a lot of the season. He pitched well early on and then missed the rest of the half of the season. So not a lot of innings built up from Joey Cantillo. He had to be on the 40. They got away with one with the roll five draft, not happening at the other off season with the lockout. Um, if he had been there, I think someone might've taken, if there was a roll, a roll five draft, I think somebody would have taken a chance on him and they, they might've gotten lucky with that one because of how he pitched last year. And obviously he had to be out of the role at, at the 40 man roster at that point. But I don't, I believe this is just me guessing. I don't have any Intel yet. I haven't had any conversations with anybody in the front office, I'm hoping to to track down um, Rob Serfolio at some point again to have another conversation with him, maybe even on the podcast. We'll see if he agrees. Uh, I talked to him a couple times last year, so hopefully we'll we'll track him down again. But my guess is that you will see Allen Bybee before you see Cantel. That's my guess. I know they both need 40 man moves if you're going to do it, but I just think that they're going to handle Cantillo very carefully. He's only at Akron. I think they'll want to progress him to Columbus slowly as well when they need to, or when, when he is ready and they want to build him up. So I, maybe a bullpen roll late in the year. I don't know. They're going to be very cautious with the inning. So I know he's on the 40 and it would take two 40 man moves. They're going to add Allen at some point. Uh, my guess, well, listen to lockdown guardians. You'll hear my guess of when Logan Allen comes up. I don't know about by the, I have a guess on when I think Logan Allen's coming up. Um, so listen to lockdown guardians as well. Um, but I, yeah, I, I would, I would, I feel pretty confident saying I believe that you would see Allen and Bybee this year before you see Cantillo. Um, Allen's going to be at it no matter what. Uh, Bybee's going to force their hand, and they're going to be concerned with Cantillo. So uh, I wouldn't get too far ahead on Cantillo, as much as I like Cantillo. Uh, Gavin Williams allegedly hit 101 on the radar gun in Bowie. Of course, we couldn't see it because Bowie's broadcast uh, stuff was down. Uh, I did notice they improved their, their camera angle a little bit. In years past, their camera angle was like a uh, broadcast perch from behind home plate, which was really, really not ideal for like, it's fine if you're just watching to watch and enjoying it. But if you really want to like, I don't know, I, I shouldn't say you can't really glean a whole lot from MILB TV. If you're trying to watch for true scouting purposes, like they're, you know, velocities and I don't know, just any, any random assortment of things. But if you're really looking to dig in, it's kind of hard uh, as much as I do watch, but they looked like they improved it a little bit this year, but they were having some, Technical difficulties, which sucks. And um, it's just not the best angle. But he reportedly hit 101, so that's good. Uh, didn't miss as many bats his first time around. But he's got 12 strikeouts and nine and third innings. Um, he'll get to Columbus at some point. I do not think you'll see Williams this year. But uh, you never know. Maybe more things forced their hand. Maybe they feel like he ends up in a bullpen role. I don't know. Very surprised to see Hunter Stanley in a starting role. And this could be a way to get, just get him some innings. Um, but he has thrown nine innings through two appearances. One was a piggyback, one was a start. Ten strikeouts, three walks. Uh, I think of four runs in the two outings so far. Um, he was really impressive in the AFL last year. I know they, they sent him to the AFL just trying to get him some innings because he had missed most of the season, and he wound up throwing really well in the AFL. So I'm not I'm pleasantly surprised he made his way to Akron, but I guess based off of his AFL exploits, that's why he's there. Um, definitely surprises even a starting role. I thought he'd be a guy who could be up as a reliever maybe next year. I'm not sure what to do with him as a starter. Maybe this is just a way to catch him up on some innings. Um, but we'll see. I, I, again, it's a very surprising role for him. Um, I do think he's more of a reliever in the future, but I'm really interested to see a lot more of Hunter Stanley and I hope to get more eyes on him, uh, pretty soon. Let's talk about Columbus real quick, man. What uh, a series Columbus had! Just a ton, a ton of runs that last uh, last couple of games against Worcester. Um, everybody was on fire. You had uh, great bats from Tyler Freeman, who was the International League Player of the Week. You had Brian Rocchio was hitting the crap out of the ball uh, this past week. I really am impressed with 
with Rokio. Um, well, he's been a little more patient. He did he did uh, take a couple strikes, a couple swings on two strike counts where he just wanted to put the ball in play, which is fine. Uh, it was just kind of some weak contact. But uh, Rokio's off to a great start. Uh, Mike Capriz was off to a good start early. He's kind of struggled a little bit as late, so we'll keep an eye on him. Um, yeah, obviously, like we said, Tyler Freeman blistering right now. Uh, I think he had 12 hits last week, and nine of them came across two games. He's hitting the ball a lot harder, I will say. Um, exit velocity wise, he's you know, he puts some balls in play that are pretty soft, but I, I've seen an increase in uh, 100 mile an hour balls off the bat for Tyler Freeman. Really excited for him. I just don't know where he would play in Lake County. That's the problem, like, or not Lake County, Cleveland. I mean, Gabriel barely plays and. He doesn't play first base as Freeman, and, and Arias has gotten some time at first base. So Freeman not playing first base, I guess, kind of hurts him. But Arias hasn't done anything wrong. I mean, he just isn't hitting because he's not playing. It's hard. He did have a home run already this year, and I, I feel I want to see more of Gabriel Arias. So it's hard to suggest where Freeman goes at this point. But he's doing really well in, in Columbus. And, you know, unfortunately, he really may not have a lot left to prove. But uh, – the situation is what it is. I mean, you could maybe send down Oscar Gonzalez and play Will Brennan in right field more, and maybe Freeman can um, get some at-bats in the outfield. They were trying to work that. I don't I don't think he has the arm for right field, so I don't think that's a really good fit. You could put him in left maybe if Quan DHs, but he doesn't have a lot of experience in any of those spots. So tough place for Tyler Freeman to be in, but he is hitting the crap out of the ball, so good for him. Bo Naylor obviously hitting the ball well kind of looking like a three-tier outcome guy. He's hitting 241. Uh, again, this is all super early. It's 54 at-bats, but he's walking a ton. There are some strikeouts. Some of them are looking because he's extremely patient, borderline passive sometimes, but the power is there. Uh, I'm just wondering, he might be a three-tier outcome hitter. He might be a guy who hits, you know, 230 or 240, but has like a an on-base percentage that's like 330 or 340 and hits for some home runs. So that's not a bad thing. So We'll see what happens to him. I, I keep seeing people talk about Zach Collins. I'm not really – it's not a prospect, so I don't want to talk about him that much, but, uh, you know, kind of a 4-8 or a hitter all his life. Really unfortunate they can't find a spot for David Fry because he's hitting the ball well. I would like to see him in a, a backup role in Cleveland just because of the versatility he can provide. So uh, I don't think that's coming anytime soon, unfortunately, just the way they've rolled things out. John Kenson, well, starting to pick it up a little bit lately, but he's got 20 strikeouts and two walks. So TBD on him. Power hitters progress a lot slower than everybody else. So I'm not going to jump a whole lot on Noel. I, I, I'm i skeptical still uh, on his future just because of the, the profile. And I will say he doesn't look out of place in right field. I don't know if you're ever going to get plus defense out of him. To me, you're going to wind up playing him in right field, and he's going to wind up being a guy that kind of stands there. And... He'll make a routine play. He's not going to help you defensively. You're just hoping this doesn't hurt you. The arm's fine out there, but uh, he looks more comfortable in right field this year than I think last year. So that's a good sign, I guess, at the least. Um, you know, left field, right field, first base is fine. I don't think he ever goes back to third base. I know people might say, oh, John Kinsen also third baseman. He's not a third baseman. Um, worry about the bat and figure out the rest later, honestly. Let's see if he can um, not be Bobby Riley 2.0 is my, my concern. Uh, two-start week for Logan Allen. He was awesome on Sunday. I thought I watched most of his start. Um, I'm mostly impressed by the fact that he pl- he pitched against Worcester twice. I believe it's Worcester. If someone's listening and knows it's different, please let me know. <laughs> um, I think it's Worcester. Um, but he pitched against them Tuesday and Sunday, and it is hard to pitch against the uh, same team two times in a week. I mean, there are times in the big leagues it happens week after week. Like, you know, Cleveland just played Seattle. Um, seven of the first uh, 10 days of the season by, or I'm sorry about Allen did it two times in, in five, in five days, six days. That's tough to do. Um, but he was good both times out. He was better. I think the second time out and he missed less bats with a sweeper, but uh, the Worcester hitters took six swings total against his sweeper, which is a slider. I know some people are like, I don't want to learn that new term. Um, the sweeper is a slider. It's just a different definition of a slider and how it moves. But uh, he they took six swings against it, and they missed all six times. So that's good for him. I'm very interested to see why he's not throwing the changeup as much, and I wonder if that has to do with the development of a slider. Maybe that the team 
the organization already feels confident in his changeup, and he should. It was his best pitch in college. He didn't really pick up the slider to this extent, the sweeper to this extent, until he got into the uh, pros. And it's become kind of his second pitch in terms of usage. So I kind of wonder if this is just like, a, let's throw it a ton, let's get comfortable with it, and then the changeup will be there because he's always had the changeup. He's a guy who didn't really throw a breaking ball as an amateur, at least not in high school. Um, I know I talked to him last year, and he said he really didn't start throwing a breaking ball uh, consistently until college. And and really coming out of the draft in 2021, his best pitch, or 2020, his best pitch was his changeup. And now he throws the sweeper more. So I wonder if that's a developmental thing. But also it'd be good for him to have a third pitch as well. He has a cutter. Um, I know there's a curveball in there. He doesn't really throw the curveball anymore, but he has a cutter. So, you know, he can go on that. The cutter is really good for him to have as that in between at the fastball and slider because he can, you know, it's like a, he throws up the fastball 90, 94 and the, the sweeper is like 80, 83. So the, the, the cutter is like 84, 86. So it's a nice, like in between pitch for him that kind of gives him the slider look, but it's not a slider, but it's also not a fastball. So that's going to help him a ton if he throws it more. Uh, so there is, you know, a four pitch arsenal there too. And I wouldn't be surprised to see more of the cutter as well. It's, Help Shane Bieber uh, a ton in a lower velocity as well. But the command was good on Sunday. Hitters did not look good against the sleeper. And he faced a ton of uh, former major leaguers. I mean, Greg Allen was in that lineup. There's been a couple of guys who have been in that, in that lineup who were uh, had success at the major league level. So, again, listen to Lockdown Guardians. We'll talk more about Logan Allen when I think he's going to come up. But uh, very promising signs from him. And obviously, everyone wants to talk about Tanner Bybee. Uh, 11 innings so far, 15 strikeouts, three walks, no runs, five hits. The man's coming fast. What can I say? Uh, he, it, I think Tanner Bybee is as ready as he's going to be. I think the biggest thing right now is that Cleveland wants him to to get his routines established and just get him comfortable off to off to a good start this season. Like if this is June, he's pitching like this. Yeah, he's going to be up. Um, there's no other way. Especially, I mean, well, it depends on who's in the rotation too. I mean, McKenzie can't be back until Memorial Day. You know, Savali's on his own timeline. We don't know. I don't know how long he can go with Gaddis and Battenfield, and who knows with Plesak. But um, Bybee's going to force their hands sooner than later. I don't know when. Truthfully, he is a complicated case. Allen has to be added to the 40, as I said, so he's a little bit less complicated. But uh, Bybee's going to force their hand. But I, I think really what, what's important is he gets a handful of starts at AAA, you know, whether it's seven, eight, whatever it is. Um, but you know, just beyond that routine, that's, what's important to Cleveland is establishing a routine, knowing what you're doing in between starts, which he does well. Uh, it's not a question of him needing a routine between starts and just putting the work in. We know Tanner by puts the work in. Um, but I think it's important for Cleveland for these guys to establish that and, and go out there week after week and build up these good starts and build up those good habits and just feel good about them and get their feet under them. Um, it's a tough time. I, they didn't want to add, trust me, they didn't want to add Peyton Battenfield, who, by the way, had a good start against the Yankees, and he earned that second start against the Tigers, and we'll see what he does. That cutter could be a real weapon for him. I think it's better than any, anybody thought. Um, I think it's going to eat the Tigers alive, as it should, because it, it ate the Yankees alive until uh, he just kind of ran out of gas, so he, they just didn't want to expose him any further. But uh, it should eat the Tigers alive. So good for Peyton Battenfield. We love him on this podcast. Obviously, he was a, a guest a year ago, and we're rooting for him. But Bybee will be up at some point this year. But I think you just want to make sure that he is comfortable, has his legs under him. He's as good as he's going to be. And I'm also waiting for him to hit 100 at the minor league level. He hit 99-4 against Worcester, Worcester, Worcestershire, whatever you want to call it. Um, he's going to hit 100 at some point this year. And, and again, I said this on Twitter the important thing about Bybee isn't the velocity. Yes, the velocity has helped him break out in this this way. But the best thing for him is that, you know, he puts in the work, which is good. The reason he's here is because of the work he's put in, uh, in his background. But the fastball he throws with good command. He can command his slider. He commands his changeup. Uh, the curveball has improved a little bit. Um, he throws it for strikes. Like he throws all four pitches for strikes and the fastball has really good carry on it, which really helps him. And that's Cleveland has kind of helped him with his delivery, which has changed that. So it's not just a velocity. It's just the command of four pitches, the pitch ability, the fact that he is willing to throw back to back changeups, a changeup in a two Oh count. He can steal a strike with the curveball. 
uh, an early in at bat, two in a hitter is not necessarily expecting that. He doesn't have to rely on the fastball. He don't throw a fastball on a fastball count. He'll make guys earn it. So uh, not just the velocity, it's the command and it's the whole arsenal and all the work he has put in to get to this point. It's coming. It's going to happen. Um, I just, I just don't know when. Real quickly, let's touch on some prospects that are kind of MIA. I wanted to ask Jason this, but I didn't want to put him on the spot, so I'll, I'll talk to him further after this. But um, Ethan Hankins is starting the season in extended spring training. Uh, it's, I guess they're trying to build him up. I mean, the guy's had a couple of years off. It's really unfortunate. Um, he hasn't pitched since 2019. I think he doesn't want to be in extended spring training. I don't know how that's going to go long term, but the guy needs to be an affiliate soon. I'm sure he wants to be an affiliate soon, but he... I don't know. It's not a, it's, we'll see how they're building him up in, in Arizona where he ends up, but it's definitely a, a curious development that he has stuck back in Arizona to start the year since he hasn't thrown an official non Arizona inning since 2019. Steven Hajar, not at an affiliate. I do not see him on anybody's, um, I don't think I see him on anybody's injured list. Oh, he is on Lake County's injured list. Okay, so I'll check on that one. I'm at Lake County this week. I kind of had the feeling they were kind of working with him on some delivery stuff. I didn't know if it was injury-related, but uh, I thought maybe there was some delivery stuff they were working on. Justin Campbell's, you know, has the elbow injury. Um, not super thrilled about that. I think uh, that elbow injury sounds pretty rough. There's another guy in college who has a similar injury or another pitcher in the minors that might have it. I can't remember who it was, but I came across somebody else with a similar injury and I looked it up and I'm not a doctor and you should never trust what you read on the internet about uh, injuries because they'll make you think you have the worst possible, you know, symptom or something. But uh seems like a rough injury. So we'll see. Carson Tucker is on the injured list in Lynchburg. I'll ask Jason. I was going to ask him here. I'm not going to put him on the spot, but uh I'll get some answers there, but uh, not a great sign for Carson Tucker. Carson Tucker uh, helped the Guardians draft PD help, and I think that might be his biggest contribution to the, to the organization. Alexi Planez also not on anybody's roster that I have seen so far. So I will. Uh, he's on the injured list for Akron. I'll get some answers there coming up. Angel Janow uh, should be back real soon. It sounds like he's hitting. Uh, a little bit in like in Arizona from what I've seen on his Instagram. So that's good to see. He'll go to Lynch Lynchburg again. And uh, who knows, maybe Nate Furman will get bumped up to Lake County. If Angel Janelle comes back and they have too many infielders up there uh, in Lynchburg. So uh, thanks for sticking with me again. Thanks for being patient. If you are a loyal listener to this podcast, uh, I do appreciate it. I know we haven't been as consistent as we have been in years past, but with me moving over to lockdown guardians full time and uh, you know, Guardians Baseball Insider shutting down and running my own site and just having some scheduling conflicts and personal things to deal with over the last week. I don't know if you read, my dad passed away, and um, so I've been dealing with that and uh, trying to manage some other things as well in the meantime, the season getting started. But, you know, we'll have Jason on again. I do appreciate Jason coming on and talking to us. Uh, we will definitely have him on again. And that's the plan for the podcast here going forward is uh, some segments with me to – talk about uh, what's going on in the system. We'll try to get broadcasters from every level coming on. We'll try to get some some player interviews, some coach interviews, some front office interviews if we can. But uh, well, I'll play those at the very least and see if anybody else wants to come on the podcast. We'll, we'll try to get in touch with Willie and see if he's got some availability. And uh, yeah, if anybody else out there is writing about prospects, we might uh, get them on here as well if they are attending games. So I will, uh, we'll have Tyler and Stacy on from Columbus when they get there. I think we'll get in touch. If you were, you caught um, last week, Matthew Cannell was in Fort Wayne to see the captain. So I think next week he and I might have a chat about the captain. So stay tuned for that. And uh, if you got any questions, you know where to find me, JL underscore baseball on Twitter. Next year in cle.substack.com. I will put that in the show description as well. Thank you for listening. Please, uh, again, if you're not on Twitter, Check out the Substack. Uh, there is a chat and a notes feature on Substack now where you can kind of have the same effect as Twitter. So if you want to reach me there, feel free um, or comment on YouTube as well. This will be up on YouTube. So plenty of ways to get in touch with me and to talk about the show as well. I do appreciate all you listening and staying patient with me. Hope to get those numbers back up. If you are a listener and you know somebody else who has listened in the past, 
uh, let them know that we're getting back to some some regularity with the podcast. And uh, if you know anybody else who also enjoys minor league content from the Guardians, please uh, share with a friend. Please, if you can, leave some comments on YouTube or leave us a review on iTunes or Spotify if you can. Uh, definitely would help get us back in front of some more eyeballs as we start to kick things back up here regularly on Guardians of the Future. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will catch you again next week.